Lee, fold it up again so all the kids see. <laughs> There's a, there's a young Jerry Mitchell high kicking right there. I'm Mark Cherry, uh, New Kid 1979. Today, I'm going to be introducing you to Jerry Mitchell, who was in the group a couple years before me. Uh, he was on West Side Story Tour before he started his career in New York. And um, our paths have crossed before out, out in the great big world. Um, and I'm going to be asking him all sorts of questions, stuff I'm fascinated by, because he's had a completely different career than I have had. I have spent my time in television while, while Jerry was on the other side of the country uh, forging many fabulous paths in Broadway history. Um, so we're gonna be talking about that. Um, we're gonna talk for about, uh, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes. I'll be asking all sorts of questions about his journey. Then we're gonna open it up to um, all, of, all of you kids who have questions and specific things you wanna know that you think might help you on your journey. The first thing I have to say is that uh, Andy Luna, who is now the uh, CEO of the Young Americans, he was on West Side Story Tour with you back 40, I think, what is it, 43? No, 43 years ago? Was it 43 years ago? At least, was, was it 43 years ago? 77? I, 77, 78, yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. Um, so, so give me your best, yeah, I just joined the Young Americans. I'm doing a show with them. Um, on the road, what's your best YA story you got? Well, I really didn't know what the Young Americans or who the Young Americans were. And I was shopping at a mall in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and the Young Americans were about to start this tour of West Side Story. And I was at the mall and they were on a dinner break. And I saw Lonnie Anderson, who I had done a production of West Side Story with in Southwestern Michigan in Kalamazoo. And they had told me that uh, Roy Diaz, one of, you know, a great young American had hurt his back and they were looking for a replacement and that I should follow the bus back to Miller Auditorium in Kalamazoo and maybe audition for the tour of West Side Story. It was 6.30 at night on, on a Thursday. And um, I'm with my dance partner, Jill Devancher, who later became a young American. And um, I, go, I go there, I go in, I know Miller Auditorium, of course, because uh, I love everything that goes to Miller Auditorium. So uh, I go in, I go into the lobby and I think it was, I think Milton Anderson was there. I, I'm not, I don't, I'm pretty sure Milton Anderson was there. And they sent me into the lobby and he said, dance around and show me what you can do. And so I started dancing full out, double pirouettes on carpeted floor, jumping, leaps, splits, anything I could do. He said, now sing me a song. I sang him a song. And then he said, would you join us on Sunday? We're going to start a tour of 42 states and 216 cities. We're doing West Side Story and you can come and be, a, be in the show and be a young American. And I said, yeah, if my parents will let me go, if my teachers will let me go. So I went, I drove home to my parents that night and, you know, back to my house and crying the whole way saying, they'll never let me go. Education comes first. Education comes first. They'll never let me go. Of course, I had gotten almost all of my credits in high school. I was a senior. I was ready to graduate, even though it was my senior year. I had just about everything I needed. So my, my, uh, my parents said, if, you're, if your principal says you can do it, you can do it. And I went to him the next morning. He said, Jerry, you're going to be doing this the rest of your life. Why wouldn't I let you go? Oh. He said, I, ha I have one thing to tell you. You have to keep a journal and you have to come back and take your government exam and you have to pass it. And I said, and I will. And so I went on the road uh, and I was on the road with everybody for uh, you know almost six months, I think it was. Got back in April, finished uh, school with my... Um, yeah, finished school with my class and graduated and all worked out. Now, what that was, was your, the Young Americans. Now, did you have much formal dance training? I mean, you know, before you I, got- I, yeah, well, Leaf could tell you about this. Andy could probably tell you about this too, if they remember. All I did was run around and dance and show everybody my dancing and talk about my dance teacher, Cindy Me. Oh, and there for um, everyone, Leaf, hold it up again so all the kids see. <laughs> there's, a, there's a young Jerry Mitchell high kicking right there in Leaf Green's uh, uh, 
camera. Yeah, yeah. I was I was one of those kids who um, uh, I got into the the I had a lo there was a local uh, theater in my hometown, the Village Players, and I got involved when I was ten years old. And the the woman who choreographed all of the shows, Cindy Meath, also owned a dance studio in my hometown, the Meath Dance Studio. But I was ten, and I was I probably knew I was gay, but I was afraid to stay to say it. And so she kept saying, "Come back," a little li like Billy Elliot. She said, "Come back, come back. You can study, and I'll teach you how to dance." And I didn't go, and didn't go, and didn't go. And then I broke my collarbone racing my friend home from a football practice. And I wanted to keep my legs in shape for basketball. So I went and took tap class. And that was it. Once I got in there, I was 15 now. I got into her class and um, she didn't make me pay, but she made me come on Saturdays and teach tap to the little kids because I was already a great tapper because uh, just doing musical theater, I'd learned so much. So she gave me a job. She gave me free lessons. I mean, she literally put the hook in my mouth and dragged me into that studio where I wanted to be anyway. And I just think back to that and how she really saw something in me I didn't know I had at the time. And so she taught me a lot from 15 to 17 until I went on the road with the Young Americans. Now, it's, it's interesting to me because you have become a choreographer and a director, that was your trajectory which um, I, I identify with because I started out as a writer and then I became an executive producer. So you start out doing one thing, but then your road takes you somewhere else. Um, how long did it, one, take you to be a dancer? And two, when did, how long as a dancer did it take you to start thinking about Oh, I want to be the guy choreographing these things. What you know? Where was that on the journey for you? The the choreography, if you if I have to be absolutely honest, really started when I was a kid. I mean, even even in those early days at 10, 11, 12, 13, I was choreographing the children's numbers at the Papa Village Players, and I was choreographing the numbers in my high school, and I was choreographing for the pom pom team and the flag team and the band, and I was choreographing as well as performing and dancing. And, um, and then I went to college and I became a choreographer for college productions. And I assisted the choreographers at the Hope Summer Repertory Theater where I apprenticed and later became a, a performer. Um, and Leith knows all about that also. And so then, I, so then I, um, I got to New York and what happened as a dancer in Broadway shows, I found myself hanging out with the choreographers and being their, their clay. If they wanted to work on a number, I said, I'll stay later and work on a number. And I started assisting great choreographers. I would work after hours with the choreographers. Agnes DeMille, Michael Bennett, Jerome Robbins, You worked Ron with Field, Agnes DeMille? Ron, yes, my first Broadway show was Agnes DeMille, Ron Field, Joe Layton. I mean, these were, uh, Anna White, these are the greatest living choreographers. And I was working with them, assisting them, helping them. And um, I was in On Your Toes, I was 23, and it was my fourth or fifth Broadway show. And we were out of town. And there's a number in the show called Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. And the ballets are choreographed by Balanchine. And the new choreography for this revival was being done by Donald Sadler. And Donald was having a really hard time figuring out this number. I happened to be at a party for the cast and I was speaking with John Malcheri, the producer and the conductor, the great conductor, John Malcheri. And he said to me, what would you do if you were choreographing that number? And I, I just went like, uh, like somebody, I was waiting for somebody to ask me that <laughs> question. And I gave him the spiel and he said, I think you should share that with Donald. And so the next day in rehearsal, Donald came up to me and said, John said, you had an idea for this number and it's a good one and I'd love to hear it. And so I told Donald my idea and then the, we started working on it in the room and it went into the show. Now we were, I think we were in, uh, at the Sanger in, in, New, in New Orleans and we were on our way to the, to the National in, um, in DC. This was prior, this was prior to Broadway. No, so this is, I'm, is I'm this confusing. I'm, we were at the, we were at the uh, Kennedy Center in DC. We were at the so Kennedy Center. Was Center. this with Laura Teeter and Makarva? And Makarva, yeah. Okay, so we I, the, but for, I want you to stop for a second because 
you worked with so many amazing choreographers. I want to make sure the kids <laughs> understand who these people were because I know their credits. You got to work with Agnes DeMille, who choreographed the original Oklahoma, among yes. other things. You got to work with Anna White, who choreographed MAME and the movie of uh, Oliver and became the first choreographer to win an honorary Oscar for choreography. That, that's right. And you worked with Ron Field, who choreographed the original Cabaret. Yes. Uh, who, else, who else am I missing here? Um, J Joe Layton on Barnum. Yeah, John. Uh, and, and then, of course, the two biggest choreographers were Michael Bennett, Michael Bennett and Bob Avian. I call them a team because they certainly are a chorus line, Dream Girls, uh, Follies, and and Jerome Robbins, you name it, West yeah. Side Story, Fiddler, every, every King other and I, show, you name it, you yeah. name it, yeah. And um, by the way, just because I'm interested in gossip, was Jerome Robbins as mean as they say he was? He was not mean to me. Okay. <laughs> he, I saw him, I, look, I tell everyone this, when, when I was a dancer, dancers were not allowed to speak in rehearsal. We basically came into the room and we were choreographed by the choreographer and we did the choreography. The world in the past 40 years, and I was at the cusp of that change because of the economics, dancers had to become singers and actors and actors had to become dancers and singers had to become dancers and actors. And so the collaboration process of a musical has grown to be much more of a democratic thing. Jerry Robbins' frustration that he would often take out on a dancer, I believe, was with himself. I watched him become frustrated as an artist because he couldn't figure it out. And when he couldn't figure it out, he would get frustrated with himself. And I certainly understand that because I've been in that position as a choreographer. I can't get it. I can't get it. How do I, and you know, you're, you're gnawing at trying to, someone look yeah. down on me, give me a sign, help me make this fabulous, right? Uh, and, and you get frustrated. And how do you handle your frustration in front of a room full of people who are looking for you to lead them? How are you a good leader, a good director, a good choreographer, an encouraging spirit, right? So I worked with him and I worked with Michael Bennett and they came from the old school. Then I met the director, Jack O'Brien. Jack oh. O'Brien is one of the greatest directors in our living in the theater, three-time Tony Award winner for plays, musicals, hairspray, everything. He ran the Old Globe Theater for forever. And that's where we met. And we met actually 10 years before that because Manny Eisenberg, who I was doing Jerome Robbins for, set us up on a lunch because he said, you guys are gonna work together someday. And 10 years later we did. But Jack was a true diplomat of the theater. He is a diplomat of the theater. He is a man who knows the word collaboration almost better than he knows anything else. And he knows how to take the best out of every artist in the room and put that into the production to make his production spectacular. And so I learned at that very moment, I was about to become a Broadway choreographer slash director from a man who everyone loved, how to be a collaborator, a gentleman, and a diplomat in the theater. <laughs> and um, it, was, yeah. it, it, was, it was a great lesson. That's and it a, came at the perfect time. Yeah, sometimes I always say for people, when you're a baby writer in television, it helps to, you know, that you had a good boss when you started because you need to learn the habits, the protocol. Um, sometimes you end up learning what not to do because you're young yeah. and you go, well, I don't like how you're handling that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the economics because the kids don't sometimes understand how things used to be in the theater, but there was a time, correct me if I'm wrong, Jerry, that there was a singing chorus and there was a dancing chorus. And in the old yeah. days, the singers sang and the dancers danced. And then as time went on and the economics changed and ticket prices got more expensive, um, they started looking for triple, at least double threats, if not triple threats. And so now I, th I would imagine it's pretty hard to get a job on Broadway if you're a dancer who can't sing or act. I would think. That's right, it is. It's much, it's much more difficult. And also almost every person you cast in an ensemble needs to be able to cover a principal part, if, if not mm -hmm. two principal parts. Every one of the kids I cast in Hairspray covers Amber, 
penny, link, seaweed, motor mouth. One of the dynamites covers motor mouth. I mean, she's too young to do it, but she has to be a cover, right? So you are looking for kids who can perform in the ensemble and also cover principal parts in a Broadway show that is selling out. They've got to go on stage and they've got to deliver the goods. You know, the first show I performed in, Brigadoon, 1979, 1980. That's with Laura Beninati's dad, right? Yes. Well, she was born and I held her in the pool. She was a baby. She was a baby. Her mom was in the chorus and her dad was the star. And, um, and uh, there were no microphones for the, the, the ensemble. We didn't wear mics. There were floor mics. You had to sing really loud, and they, you, the floor mics picked up your singing. There were, I did not wear a microphone as a solo performer in a Broadway show until my fourth Broadway show. Uh, that yeah. was when suddenly the ensemble now would all have microphones. You know, we are all trained to sing for recording studios, not for the back wall like Ethel Merman. Right. No, yeah. Um, a as, as a matter of fact, you say that um, it is my understanding in theater history that what the, the kids might not know today, audiences prior to television were much better at being audiences. They were much more quiet and they listened. They knew how to listen. And I've heard it said by theater historians that it was Ethel Merman and Ray Middleton in the original cast of Annie Get Your Gun. They were so they were both so loud and the audience enjoyed it so much <laughs> that um, people really g got into, into that sound. And that started the transformation into the need for floor mics and, and whatnot, because obviously there was a time where there was Broadway going on, but there were no mics, no mics yeah. at all. And yeah. so kids, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting because that's why theater singing was different then. And of course now, people can sing smooth pop style songs and they can do rock and roll because you didn't, don't have to do legit operatic, you know, musical theater singing. So yeah. there's, it's, it's opened up creatively. And I would imagine from a chore choreography standpoint, you guys probably can do more interesting choreography now because people are mic'd, right? Well, it's not, not only can you do more interesting choreography, the nuance is so, fi so much finer because, because the voice, First of all, the, the voices that I'm sure every one of these people on this call has and the voices that are coming to Broadway by young people. I sit in auditions, half of my life is sitting in a room listening to people sing and they come in the room and they sing and I am so blown away at their, their craftsmanship, their style, their sense of self in their music when they sing to me. I, I, sing, I sing like a, you know, like a chorus member in a Broadway show in 1979, <laughs> and I still sing the same damn song. But I mean, their, their ability, I, I mean, when I listened to, I was listening to Billie Eilish singing that song that she just sang on the DNC the other night. I had heard it when, when it came out. And I listened to that performance and I was like, holy shamoly, that girl, that voice, what she's doing, those things she does, those little teeny riffy things. Uh, it's just magic. It's vocal magic. And, and what we wouldn't be able to do if we didn't have mics now in the theater, we wouldn't be able to hear that nuance. So I'm all for it. It's just a, it's just a different world. Yeah. And you and I are of the same generation and I'm a big, you know, a little bit of a theater historian. I kind of um, grew up wanting to to go work in New York, which is so funny that I, I have spent my entire career doing just television because I love the theater. I love musical theater. It's what I train for. And the kid kids today don't necessarily, some probably have the same kind of curiosity that I did, but understanding that crooners, people like Bing Crosby, no one sang like Bing Crosby, but once recording microphones became a, a, a part of the industry. And I think, I believe Michael Feinstein told me it was the early 30s, like 30, 31. And Bing Crosby introduced a new kind of singing where you could just sing very small, but the, the microphone did the heavy lifting. And that yeah. of course um, coincided with the introduction of sound into motion pictures. So there's an evolution that comes all the way going from silent films and people singing on stage without mics to the introduction of microphones and technology in movies. And, uh, and then 
you know, technology is swept through Broadway and lighting setups are far more complicated. And you guys now even have computers, I think, doing your rigging or like, you know, oh. talk about that. Like, you know, you you it, it, everything, everything in the theater is everybody's got their tables set up in tech rehearsal. Everything's computerized. And uh, it, it just is the way it works now. It's, it's all computerized. Everything's computerized. The lights, the sets, the costumes, the way things move. It's all on computer. Now, um, how many shows did, were you a dancer in before you became a choreographer? Well, after, uh, after The Young Americans, I, I, I worked at the Hope Summer Repertory Theater a second summer as a hired actor and a choreographer. And then I went to Webster University, Webster College at the time. And uh, um, I was there for two years on campus. And then I got picked up by Michael Bennett and Bob Avian to tour the United States in a chorus line my sophomore year, after my sophomore year. Who'd you before play? Before I came, uh, I was Don, I, I, was I was a cover. When you got hired at that time, you'd they'd hire you to cover and then they'd put you into a track. But I wasn't there long enough to really be in a track. So I did Don, Greg, Al, and Bobby in my 10, 10 weeks. I played it for the summer and then I went right to Broadway and did Brigadoon, which I had gotten before a chorus line when I was there in spring break. Oh. So uh, I did chorus line on the road. I did Brigadoon, uh, Woman of the Year with Lauren Bacall, Barnum, uh, and, then, and then On Your Toes. And then I left and became really a choreographer, an associate, an assistant. And then I did one last show, The Will Rogers Follies, uh, before I really hung up my dancing shoes. Okay. I, um, it's so funny. Um, chorus line, I have a funny story that has to do with a young American. So when I was 15 years old, I saw the original Los Angeles uh, touring company of Chorus Line. And at the age of 15, you know, the, the climax of the show, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, climax of the show, the character of Paul hurts his leg and, and yes. like he'll never dance again. And then um, Morales sings What I Did for Love. And I thought it was the most devastating thing I'd ever seen, the idea that my dreams could be ruined. Many years later, I went to New York for my very first Broadway trip in 1989 and got to see Diana Cavillis, who I had done the Gershwin tour with, um, and she was playing Val in A Chorus Line on Broadway. She was the last Val in the original Broadway company. And I got to see the show again. And at this point, I'm 27, I'm working in TV. And you get to the point where Paul breaks his leg. And I'm like, oh yeah, that happens to dancers. <laughs> so suddenly I had a completely different perspective on it because I had lived for a while and understood, you know, the transitory nature of both dancing as a career. It's a difficult career to keep going and which yeah. makes your, your accomplishment so important. And it was also, you know, something where I was like, oh yeah, that's, I'm so glad I don't do that for a living because I'm, I just have to be funny and I can be doing that till I'm 87. Um, <laughs> so, so let me ask you a question. So where did you develop as a choreographer? And I'm so fascinated by this. Choreographers, because you can get a job doing The King and I, where the choreography has to, to represent movement from Thailand. You can get something from Brigadoon, where it's suddenly Scottish sword dancing. How did you develop all your choreographic language? And, and how much research did you do on your own? How much of it is paying attention? What do you do to prepare for a show where the movement doesn't come you know, second nature to you? Well, let me take a show that everyone probably on this call is a little bit familiar with, Hairspray. Um, when I was given this job to choreograph Hairspray, um, Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman, who were great friends, uh, asked me to do the job. And um, I met with John Waters. One of the first things I got to do was hang out with John Waters. And John oh, Waters- So the kids know John Waters directed the original movie of Hairspray and then um, Mark and Scott were the composer lyricist. Go ahead. John. And John Waters wrote, wrote the movie and directed it and, um, and many other great movies with his dear friend Divine who played, who played Edna Turnblatt. But um, um, so John met Jack and I, Jack was the director, I was the choreographer and took us on a tour of Baltimore to show us all the places that were in the, in the story. And he said something to me that was the starting point. He said, the year is 1962 and it's before the assassination of President Kennedy. He said, and there was still innocence in America. And he said, and I need you to 
to know that as you develop. Now, I was born in 60, so I do not remember Kennedy's assassination as, a, as an adult. I was three years old when it happened. So I went back to research dance and choreography from 1959 to 1962. And I looked at every move that was done on American Bandstand, on Shindig, on Hullabaloo, on anything I could find at the Museum of Television in New York City. Then I met with a couple who were original dancers on the Buddy Dean show in Baltimore, which is what the story Hairspray is based on. The Corny Collins show is the Buddy Dean show. And Buddy Dean was a local DJ, just like Dick Clark, in Philadelphia. And they were both at the exact same time and Dick Clark became Dick Clark and Buddy Dean became someone we, none of us really know. Yeah. But I met two dancers who were married and they met on the show and they were still together and they taught me the original Madison and talked to me a lot about dancing as a teenager on a TV show. And so I started with their lives and I started with the real Madison and I started with research. Then I put together my own vocabulary using some steps that were done in the 60s, the locomotion, the holly gully, the watusi, uh, the pony. And then I created some of my own moves. Serve it up, I called one thing like you're a waiter serving up a thing and I put it in nicest kids in town. I would create my own, the funky chicken, the stricken chicken, that's the funky chicken, but your head is cut off. Wah, wah, wah. And I created <laughs> these things and put them in the show and they became my vocabulary for the for the musical. And the and I made it and I and because the show is about integration, I wanted to make a statement about the way white kids danced and the way black kids danced. And so all of my choreography for white kids was from the waist up. And all of my choreography uh -huh. for the black kids was from the waist down. And, and I had, of course, incredible dancers helping me out on both sides. So I was using what they were bringing into the room also. Um, you know, they were spectacular, spectacular performers. Um, and um, yeah, so that was how I did that show. Um, Kinky Boots, you know, I, I, when Kinky Boots, I was working on it. We were in, we were in workshops and I wanted to put on, I was ready to start creating the numbers and um, Harvey's script. Of course, I went to the story, had all of these scenes where the shoes are being delivered on conveyor belts. Now, I also went as soon as I was done with my last lab to Northampton to the Tricker Shoe Factory where they shot the movie and I toured the shoe factory and learned how to make a shoe because I had no idea how to make a shoe and I needed to have that information in order to direct actors on what they're doing in a factory making shoes. And as I observed the factory, I realized there are no conveyor belts delivering shoes. That was a made up idea. Ah. But, it, but it's a theatrical idea that I thought I'm gonna use those conveyor belts. And I thought, I thought back to a video that I'd seen just when YouTube started of a band called OK Go where they're dancing on gym treadmills and four, four guys are dancing on gym treadmills. It's called OK Go is the band. You should look up their videos on YouTube. OK Go, their videos are fantastic, um, all of them. And I used that, I showed that to David Rockwell, my set designer. I said, I want you to build me four treadmills that are the shape of conveyor belts that are six feet long, up off the floor, and I want one in two weeks because I'm gonna get on and start moving. So he built me the treadmill. They sent it to the rehearsal studio. I got on it and it jerked and stopped and I fell off of it probably 15 times. I called him up and I said, okay, two things. You have to send it back to the shop. You have to get it to work without jerking and you need to go fast and slow. Slow for the shoes, fast for a dancer. And I need poles. I need poles because equity won't let me put a dancer on this thing because they'll fall. They need something to hold on to if they need to hold on. So instead of putting poles in one place, I said, put eight holes on the treadmill and give me the pole that I can shift to any position I want. And I said, I also want a six foot ledge on one side that I can step off of 
and somebody can zoom past me and I can jump back on the treadmill for couples work. So they did those, they sent the thing back. We got on it. I had two, two or three dancers. We started playing with ideas. We worked on two speeds. Stephen Aremis, the musical director, came into the room. I said, I, needed, I need to know now what the tempo of this song is gonna be. We need to set it because I need to set this treadmill to push a button and it will go to the tempo so I can walk in rhythm. No questions asked. So we set a tempo a year before the first performance of that musical and we've stuck with it from 10 years in 20 productions all over the world. Set that tempo, set the tempo for the shoes, sent the thing back, they did it, two buttons, no turn, no dial, two buttons, slow and fast, sent it back. I okayed it, sent it back, said, send me five now. They sent five treadmills. I got six dancers together. I spent four weeks developing this treadmill dance for the end of act one, where the entire company is celebrating the, the celebration of the first pair of kinky boots. That's, um, that's a good question I wanna ask right now, which is, Kids, just raise your hands. How many of you have either heard the album or seen the show of Kinky Boots? Because <laughs> I'm always fascinated. I'm always fascinated by what the kids, you know, because I my Broadway awareness was only through um, albums, because um, I never went to the uh, West uh, East Coast when I was a kid. So for yeah. those of you who don't know, the show takes place in a shoe factory. So so what I find fascinating that that we're we're going over here. Um, because one of the things that I think, Jerry, you and I have in common, even though we do completely different disciplines, is we're storytellers. And, Always. you know, the older I get, the more I realize every person involved, the set designer, the costume designer, the lighting designer, you know, the writers, the directors, the choreographers, we're all invested in the story and we are all a part of it. And indeed, the actors and the dancers and the chorus, they are all storytellers, too. Um, and they're usually the director and the writer are setting out a vision. And so everyone is, is helping be a part of that. But that's one of the things that I think is so important for kids to know is start paying attention to the story because your job is to serve the story, to help the director and the choreographer and or the choreographer, depending upon if it's somewhat two different people. Um, it's your job to help them, assist them in, in executing their vision of the story. Um, everyone, every time you sing a song, you're telling a story. The lyric is a story, and it's your job to interpret that story to the audience. It's not a song. It's not just singing notes and making pretty sounds. That Anybody can do that. The, great, think, the great singers tell stories when they sing the songs. I and they, think cap, they captivate you with their lyrical quality. The so. most important thing for me when I'm, I'm auditioning actors, because you, you can find this, and it, I think this applies to singing as well. Um, and I'm going through auditions right now for the second season of my TV show. Is that there will be people who do things perfectly? Um, and there's a uh, leaf's holding up the conveyor belt with all the dancers. You will. <laughs> there are many people who will show to an audition, and they will dance something technically perfect, or they will sing something perfectly in terms of technique. But then there will be the person who doesn't quite have the technique but they have more emotional connection, more emotional resonance. Yeah. And in, in, invariably, that's the person that you go with because they have the effect to move you, the audience member, or the, the director who's looking for, for someone to cast. Um, at this point, we've well, been talking- Well, if, if, if you have seen Kinky Boots, and does, does anybody know who Billy Porter is? Uh, or who Billy, yeah. Billy Porter might be? So Billy Porter, you know, the first person who, did, did anybody see Jesus Christ Superstar on NBC? Uh, Brendan Victor Dixon, who won an Emmy Award, I think played the role of Judas, correct? Uh, Brendan was the first Lola for me in Kinky Boots. He sang the role in the first workshop. Oh. And he did a beautiful job but he was not right for the part. And I knew that, and, and he didn't audition for it. He just came in and sang it for me as a, as a, as a gesture. But um, I knew he wasn't going to continue because he wasn't the right match for the role. And in the process of the writing and hearing those songs for the first time, in the back of my head, I said, I need Billy Porter. And Billy and I had known each other since Billy was 19. 
So Billy and I had worked together three other times and I need Billy Porter. And I didn't know where Billy was, although we say each other and stayed in contact. So I reached out to him. He was reaching out to me at the same time because he'd heard about it. I cast him in the show and the rest is sort of history as we know. Yeah. Um, at this point, we've been talking for 40 minutes and I, I think it's time to get you guys in with yeah, questions. questions. So um, I'm going to, uh, I hope I can see everyone. Um, so if any of you have a question, I'm going to try to to go around and uh, just, you know, raise your hand um, if there's anything that you want to ask about and, uh, and, and we can ask Jerry a question or if there's a topic that you want covered. So I'll, does anyone I'll, want to go first? Let me just interrupt, Mark. There's a um, 14 people who are not seeable right now. They're, they don't have video. Um, so we can use the chat feature below. If somebody has a question that's not on the video, they can just type it into the chat and then we can answer it. Okay, great. Then um, people can do that. Um, and then just unmute your, well, just raise your hand. Does anyone have a question? Come on, you've got like, oh, there you go. Chloe, unmute yourself and ask your question, Chloe. Um, hi, I'm Chloe from Japan. Um, thank you so hi, much Chloe. for this opportunity. Hi, um, it's not really a question, but can you tell me that if I tell this story to you, that would be really cool. So I'm just going to start. It's not a oh. question, but so um, in 2007, when I was seven, I watched the Hairspray for the first time and it was my very first American culture. And since then I started to like have interest in the American theater performing arts. And one of the show that I watched with my mom was Kinky Boots in 2016 <laughs> in Japan. And at that time, like I didn't even know about the young Americans, but like I thought like I was so inspired by the show. So I really wanted to like tell those people that I was so inspired like in four years ago from now. And Chloe, I'm did, that. did Chloe, did you see the American cast or the Japanese cast? I watched the American one. So you saw Jay Harrison G play yeah. Lola. We just yes. did a thing. We just did a talk for Japan for the Orb Theater. He's wonderful, and I love Japan. I love everyone over there. I'm very, I'm very sad about the passing of Haruma. Uh, which is just a, a terrible shame, and we we really uh, the the leading the leading man the, who played Lola uh, died recently, and it was a big blow because he was major star, major star. Um, actually, one of the one of the things yeah, that Jay. that this brings up, which is the the wonderful thing for uh, someone like me who does television, or Jerry who has various touring companies that go out through through not only throughout the country of America but through the world is you you sometimes forget because you're so busy doing your day to day how many people your work touches and I think it's one of the nicest um, privileges of what what it is we do because there are certainly young people all over the country who see these shows um, and are influenced by them inspired by them as much as chorus line devastated me it inspired me um, and, uh, and I think that that's, that's why it's an honor to be a performer, because as you get to entertain, you get to make your living doing something you like, you also have the opportunity to inspire new generations. And I, th I think that's maybe the best thing about being in um, show business. Is there any other you, question? You, you, let me just, let me just uh, elaborate on that. You have sure. the opportunity, you have the opportunity, you also have the responsibility. Oh. You know, you, you, you're in a business, if you're lucky enough to get in a Broadway show, you had better go full out, as I always say to every performer I work with, because there are 10 other performers in the alley waiting for me to come out and say, just like I, you guys did to me when I was at the mall in Kalamazoo, uh, someone hurt themselves, would you like to be in the show? There are people waiting waiting you cannot enter this business unless you are disciplined driven you have the, the desire to be in it and the determination to make it happen you need the four d's if you don't have them stop now really really i'm giving you i'm helping you out because it is not for the weak at heart it's it it takes everything you've got to succeed in New York City and on Broadway. Everything, everything you've got. 
And I think, and I think the thing that the people need to, you know, that will help you on your way, because it is the, it's, there's so much rejection, because it's a, someone like me, who I've written a role, I've written a whole, whole show, and I'm just looking for the people who embody my vision. And sometimes people come in, and they're not what I thought I wanted at all. And I'm like, oh, you convinced me. Your talent is such that I'm, I'm willing to, to go a different way. Or sometimes I'm like, no, I know exactly what I want. But, um, you know, the, the hardest thing for young people is when they say thank you next to not take it personally, because it is personal. Yeah, you, you, you should. But, but you're so right, Mark, because I say this to, to people all the time. I said, you're not competing with the person who went in before you or the person who's coming in after you. You're actually competing with yourself. You have to prepare yourself to be everything they want when you walk in that room. And I, all, I also always say this, I said, maybe it's not a match. Maybe you come in and you're just not a match for the role. And I say, thank you, next. And you leave the room. Bernie Telsey is my casting director. He's sitting with me at the table. I am casting Becoming Nancy, Kinky Boots, Hairspray, and Pretty Woman, and Bernie's doing all four shows. I say you're not right for this, but I give him your picture and on your picture and you don't know, I've written, I think he might be right for this, call him in for this and I pass it back to him and you get a call back for something else that you didn't even know existed because that's why you can never think that an audition is a waste of time or is gone bad because you don't, and I'm just one person in the room. There's a musical director in the room. There's an assistant, a, a, a casting person in the room. There's, a, there's usually a reader in the room. The reader may see you and say, oh my God, I saw this great audition today. He'd be perfect for your play. You gotta call him up. Here's his name, I got it. You, know, you have no idea. So go in, do your thing, be you, be comfortable being you, be proud of who you are when you walk in that room, be a positive person, say, I wanna do this, I wanna work with you, I wanna do this 24 seven, I'm ready. And then wherever it lands, it's gonna land. And this is why- You're gonna be doing that every day of your life if you wanna be in this business, every single day. Yeah, this is, this is why training is so important because there, there are dancers and singers who have been taking lessons since they were six and seven, and they've got stage mothers, and they've done shows everywhere. So, you know, everyone can proceed at their own pace, but just so you know, a lot of people work for the same dream. Many are called, few are chosen, is kind of how that goes. And um, any other questions uh, about yes. anything we're talking about? Um, Brooke, Brooke uh, if you can unmute yourself, Brooke Harper. Am I allowed to ask a question as a faculty member? <laughs> yes, you absolutely can. <laughs> Hi, Jerry. This is so exciting. Um, Hi, thank Brooke. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, can you tell us in the last, you know, three to five years, some of the shows on Broadway that have just really blown your hair back? Well, I, uh, first of all, uh, everything I've seen, because uh, I, I always find something I'm like, wow, when I see a show. Uh, I saw Hades Town, of course, and Andre De Shields, who was, you know, I, I, I worked with Andre in the Full Monty, and then I worked with him on a show called Halftime just about a year and a half ago. And uh, he's just amazing. And I was so proud of him and so happy that he won a Tony Award for his work. And so he blew me away, and I loved the show. And, um, and then I saw... Um, uh, Sergio's work in Ain't Too Proud, brilliant, brilliant work. And everybody in the show, Ephraim Sykes, who was in Hairspray Live for me as Seaweed, incredible, incredible work, all of it. Is them. that Sergio Trujillo? Um, yeah, my Sergio. Sergio, okay. was, Sergio was a dancer in LA. I, got, I was flown out to LA by Jerry Robbins to audition dancers for Jerome Robbins Broadway. I came back with two dancers, Sergio Trujillo and Nancy Ticketin. Sergio became my best friend. He became my assistant. He became my associate. He worked with me on Broadway Bears. He worked with me on two other musicals. Then he became his own choreographer. I mean, you know, these relationships with these people, that's what happens. Um, what else have I seen on Broadway that I loved uh, recently? Um, I, I, of course, love Darren, Devin Hansen, you know. My favorite uh, show of the last decade. Um, uh, what else has been on Broadway? Book I saw Moulin Rouge. I loved everybody in Moulin Rouge. I'm just, you said the last three years. So I'm oh, thinking yeah, about the last three years, last three years, last three years. 
Um, I didn't get to see Diana, but we're all going to see it on Netflix. So there you go. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know, there's a musical about Princess Diana that's coming out that's gotten some interesting buzz. By the way, are you, you know what I with you know what I saw you know what I saw in London, and I went back three more times after I saw it, and then I invested in the Broadway production, and it was supposed to open the night Broadway went into quarantine. Was Six the musical? Have you heard the score of Six the musical? I have oh not. My God, you have Toby and Fran, Toby and Lucy, that score. I can sing you every song. I listen to that score every day and I don't listen to Broadway show tunes. It is incredible. Get the musical six. Get um, it. For those of you who don't know, it's about the six wives of Henry VIII. So, and it's, uh, it's like rock pop. Is that the style of the music? No, it's like he wrote a song for Ariana Grande. He wrote a song for Beyonce. He wrote a song for Dua Lupa or whatever her name is. I don't even know her name, but I love her. Um, he wrote a song for every pop diva right now. It's now, it's today. The music is right now and it's brilliant. They are brilliant writers. That is terrific. Um, any other questions? Who? Um, oh, uh, Colleen, I saw Colleen Bunt first. By the way, great name, Colleen. Thank you, hi, nice to meet everybody. Um, Hi, Colleen. So actually, something cool. Uh, so I, I'm from Chicago, but I'm currently in New Orleans. I took a little bit of a career change. Instead of musical theater, even though that's my love, I'm uh, in the band scene right now. And we're actually, my band is kind of collaborating with a luxury planner, a event planner that does like, they've done Nick Jonas's wedding and all these like celebrity things, which is like super Fabulous. cool. My passion is still musical theater and even though I'm somewhere that's great and I'm making a great living, I still want to go to New York, but I'm afraid, well, especially right now with COVID, but I'm afraid to make that jump to New York having not really any, I don't have any credentials that, that are musical theater, anything outside of high school because I went straight into Young Americans. Um, so without those equity, big name kind of shows, I feel like because I actually went, I, I had a private audition for Six the Musical in Chicago at the Shakespeare Theater um, because I yeah. was working uh, with Robert, Roberta Ducek uh, with the mm -hmm. Brilliant Theater, who's absolutely incredible. But I feel like even though I know I would be the hardest worker in the room, because that's what I strive to be, I, yeah. I feel like I can't get that across in an audition and, and in my resume. And I don't know how to turn heads you need to you need to get a obviously you're a singer you're a great singer because you've got a band and you you know that's probably what you do so you need to get a you need to get your tape uh, obviously you got to have you got to have some tapes of you singing get a tape get a get a reel get a picture and you got to get it out to casting agents in New York City the Telsey group uh, um, um, uh, anyways you got to look you got to look it up you can look it up online on the websites and whatever I think it's um, backstage has a website that tells you everything that everybody's doing playbill i think always tells you but i'd get i get my reel out to the casting agents to the casting houses particularly the musicals the telsey office um i'm mm -hmm. trying to think of the other names of the big broadway casting tara rubin's office cast a lot of musicals there are a lot of you got to realize there are there are seven companies of six out now or there will be when, are you when we're back working that many yeah yeah, they've got two or three in London. They've got one here, a tour plan. They've got three cruise ships that are, that are, that are and the cruise ships have to replace their casts every six months. So there's a lot there. And, you know, like when Kinky Boots was at its, at its top, we had 10 companies running at the same time all over the world. So, you know, there's a lot of actors. Look at all the companies in Hamilton that are running. I mean, and, you know, they, they employ a lot of actors. So get your stuff out to the casting people. That would be my, I mean, look at Lena Hall. You know Lena Hall? Do you know who Lena Hall is? She was Itzhak and she won the Tony for Itzhak and Hedwig on oh, Broadway. Yes, yes. So, mm -hmm. so I told her to go do that audition. She was, she was, um, she was Nicola for me in, in Kinky Boots. And I had done the original Hedwig off Broadway with John Cameron Mitchell. And I said, Lena, you have to go audition for this role. You're going to play this part. She's got a rock band. And now she's mm -hmm. got a Tony Award. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can do it. Get your, get your music out to the, peep, to the casting people. That's what I would say. I think the other, thing, the other thing I would love to hear from you, Jerry, I have my own opinion on this. 
How much do you care about the resume and how many credits someone I has? I never look at the resume. I, I never don't either. Look at the re I look at the resume after the audition. Yep. Not before the audition. I look at the person in the room. If the person turns me on, I call them back. If they really turn me on, I hire them. Sometimes I check on them before I hire them. I, I look at who they've worked with. I call Susan Stroman. I say, hey, I'm about to hire this person for a major role. Are they going to be a lot of fun in the room? Uh, you know, I, I, you know, it's important. The, the, the wake you leave is important because people will check up on you. They will check up. Yeah, um, there is, that's something that um, all, you know, producers, directors do, because it's the, I'm about to hire someone, please tell me they're not crazy. That's the I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend, if it's a new musical, I'm gonna spend at least the next year to year and a half with you, working on developing a role for you to debut in a Broadway show. I want to be able to go out to dinner with you afterwards and talk about the work and continue to continue to to grow and and develop. I mean, I, I really want to be around you. I don't want to come into work and go, oh, God, I can't wait to get out of here and leave this person. You know, I want to be around you. I want to support you. I want to lift you. I want to present you to the world. So you know yeah you got to you got to know it's a it's a we're we're going we're going in deep together and we're going to be we're going to be like brother and sister for the next year and a half yeah it's one of it's something that they actually don't talk about as you do your training for singing and dancing and acting which is just a part of being a person who's collaborative and you know you want to be able to to offer um suggestions when your director or producer needs them but you also need to know when to shut up um, yeah. That's that's something I had a director uh, let me know because I was just <laughs> had so many ideas and he said be quiet to me one time and he explained it to me and what's great is I'm still friends with this director 35 years later and what's funny is I became a writer because I had so many ideas I was I was much better at coming up with stuff than I was at actually the performing so I you know I kind of figured that out at an early age. Um, every every choreographer and every director that I know who works on Broadway has, if they like a dancer or a singer, they will hire them again and again and again. And I do that all the time because I know I can count on that person to deliver for me. They will come in, they will do the job, they will bring them their whole self to the rehearsal room. They'll inspire me when I'm working on a number. They'll do something silly and I'll go, oh my God, I love that, let's, let's work on that, let's put that in the show, let's figure out a way to use that material. You know, it's a, it isn't just show up, it's, it's, it's more than that. You have to want to, like I said, you have to, I didn't, I didn't want to go to, you know, the Christmas party at home. I wanted to be in rehearsal. I didn't mind if I had to miss the wedding. I wanted to be in rehearsal. I wanted to be in the Broadway show. I mean, I, I gave up a lot of sacrifice to be where I was. And I still have amazing relationships with my family and my friends who understood what it was I was going after. So, yeah. You know, and I also think that that's why the Young Americans is so important, is it teaches you to be in a group of people. It teaches you how to share. Like you're yeah. not always going to get the solo. You're going to be helping support those with the solos. Um, you're going to be a part of a bigger production number. So um, that's why I think the training is so important because it teaches you, some, some people just want to be the star. It's like, nah, you might want to learn how to, to be a supporter first. Um, I think start, you know, being in the, the solo spot, one, isn't always as fun as you think, and two, you have to earn it, and I think that takes time. Do we have any other questions for Jerry? Come on, kids. Sure. Don't be shy. Oh, oh, I've got, okay, I've got a couple people. I'm going to go to Logan first, and then Charles Martinez. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, I actually have, like, because you talked about the like work ethic you did and like I was kind of like the same way and I'm just getting out of out of high school so literally like I was a part of an acapella group and like so when you're talking about team and stuff and how many things like the challenge for me was like I was always that person who was in a practice room always practicing and doing that things but you know there always comes a point where like you know life gives you an unexpected turn and for me that was when like my dad had cancer 
So that's when things got a little harder for me to even try to get through it. So with you, Jerry Mitchell, what was like your kind of like unexpected thing, but what got you through it? Because I know in that in this industry, you know, it's not always going to be like like butterflies life, and stuff. There's always no, a challenge. No, 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 it isn't. And life can hit you right. You know, what's weird is sometimes you'll, you'll be at the top of something. Something really incredible will happen for you. And then real life will come in and smack you in the face and say, hey, there's real life too. And um, I'm sure that's probably what you experienced with your father. I was actually in tech rehearsal for Hairspray in Seattle and my father had a heart attack. And I, um, had to, I had to leave and fly home to be with him because I wouldn't have not done that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I remember Jack O'Brien, I had, I had an associate with me, an assistant, and we were literally about to start our previews. Um, wow. And he said, you have to go. And I said, I know, but I feel like I, he said, no, 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 no. He said, we're gonna be fine. You've choreographed the show. We're ready for our audience. We're ready to perform. You go see your dad and make sure your dad's okay. And when you're comfortable, come on back. No, we'll no. be okay until you get back here. And, and I was young at the time as a choreographer. It was only like my second or third Broadway show that I was working on. And in, when you're in the position of a choreographer, you know, this is a multi-million dollar production, right? A multi-million dollar production. And I'm the person who's supposed to be responsible for delivering all of the dance. So I got on a plane, I went home, I sat with my dad, he was out of surgery, he was okay. I was with him for two days and then he said, you gotta get back there. He said, you gotta go do that, I'm gonna be okay. And, um, but I, I wouldn't have not gone. So mm -hmm. you, 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 you figure out a way to make it work. And the people who love you and believe in you and believe that what you're doing matters to, to, to you, they don't want you to miss what you're doing for them. They really don't. They want you to succeed. So you have to figure out how do I, how do, I do what I have to do for my family and how do I do what I have to do for myself? Oh, and and you know, you'll, you'll find your way, you'll, you'll be able to do it. You can do it all. You actually can do it all. And that's just one instance where I have mm -hmm. had, had life hit me in the face mm -hmm. in a moment when I was really riding a high wave. Um, so it happens. I have an interesting story for you guys about this kind of thing that we're talking about here. Um, uh, how many of you have seen the movie Thoroughly Modern Millie? Have any of you ever seen that movie with Julie Andrews, Mary Tyler Moore? <laughs> Um, the star of this, uh, one of the stars of this movie, a char great character actress named Beatrice Lilly. If you ever want to see her, she's in that movie. Beatrice Lilly was a very famous music hall performer in England in the 1940s. And she, it was during World War II and her son was in the Air Force or the British Royal um, Air Force. And she was starring in a show on the West End and her son was killed in the war and she had them write on the chalkboard as every actor performer came in because everyone knew about it that her son had died and she wrote on the chalkboard i appreciate how you all are feeling and what you're feeling for me but we have a show to do and that woman went on that day that her child died and she did her show because that was her job she she was the star she couldn't take a night off. And it was in the, during the war and many people had that kind of tragedy and personal loss during the war. And I think about that and it's just something, it's something to consider, especially during this time of COVID when there's so much loss around us that, that your responsibility as a performer to carry on, the show must go on. There's a reason that that saying exists because it has to do with, you know, life will, there will be tragedies and sometimes you can take the night off to go grieve. Sometimes you can't. And so it's just something for you guys to think about because um, as much fun as this is, as you get older and you have more responsibilities and your life becomes more rich, you know, with, with, with children, with spouses, with aging parents, um, there will be loss and there will be times when life comes and as Jer Jerry so eloquently said, it hits you in the face. 
And, uh, and that's going to be part of your growing experience is to learn to deal with it because we're not the insurance company where you just, you take a day off and they don't miss you. Uh, in show business, we, we miss you. Uh, Charles Martinez, do you, what is your question? Hello. Uh, so this is like a specific question to one of your shows you worked on, um, your, the revival of La Cajo Fall. Yeah. Um, the production of that was originally, I know the revival was in London, and I don't believe you're on the creative team for that, but then it came to Broadway. So how did that work with some of the cast coming from the London production into the Broadway production and you being the choreographer? How does that work with you, like working um, with people who have just done the so, show into? Okay, that? so Charles, you're thinking of the most recent revival of La Caja Full, right? I did, mm -hmm. the rev I did the first revival. I did the one before that. You probably weren't born yet. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was 2005 i think my revival who was who was in your revival who were the stars it was gary beach oh, and gary. Um, da and danny davis and then danny davis was replaced by robert goulet robert goulet my god robert goulet <laughs> so yeah and gavin creel um was in it he played he played um the sun and so that was, I won the Tony Award for that revival. I had 16 Kajels. It was a big, splashy version of the show. Um, uh, the one that came from London was the small little one, which was fantastic. Um, but I can answer your question in another way. Priscilla, Queen of the Desert was playing in London and they decided to bring it to Broadway, but they weren't happy with the show the Nederlanders, and they wanted someone from Broadway to tell, help them make some changes as they brought it stateside. So they brought me into the production to work with the team from Australia to help shape the book in a better way for Broadway. And I worked with them as best I could, but they didn't want to take a whole lot of notes. So the show became what the show was. But the question you're asking is, how do you collaborate when you're brought in on a, I think you're asking is how do you collaborate when you're brought in on a project that already exists? It's very difficult because there are relationships that have been formed and, you know, no one, no one goes into this business to work thinking that they're doing bad work. Everyone thinks they're doing good work. So if you're brought in to try and help it or make it better, that's already a tricky position to be in as an artist. Um, so it's an it's a interesting situation. I've done it once. I don't know that I'd ever want to do it again, actually, <laughs> because I'm not sure there's a lot of upside to it for the time you invest. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm always willing to help my friends with their productions. If friends come to me and ask me, oh my God, I'm stuck. Can you give me help? Can you help me out? You know, Michael Bennett did it all the time. Tommy Toon, they did it all the time. They helped other people, their friends out if they needed help. Yeah. Now I have a question, Jerry, uh, what I don't know the answer to. So if you're hired to, for an original Broadway cast, you're a part of the creation of the choreography and staging. So you're there during that creative process. But if there's a tour out and you're a guy dancing in a lobby and they come and say, come be a part of this and they stick you in, um, how much do they just tell you every hand gesture, every movement, and your job is just to learn that and then you're a part of it? Is there much alteration when uh, you go into a tour and, you know, you're the second person to essay the role? How, how does that work? If you're, in the, if you're in the ensemble, no, there's not much alteration. If it's a principal role, for me, uh, when I hire, when I do a second company, I like to, I'll, I'll say it like this. I have hired a group of actors to perform in my show. I need them to invest in the show. The only way I can make them invest in the show is by getting them to deposit into the show. In other words, put their energy, put their effort into the, into the creation. So I have to start over with these new people and I have to make them believe that they are part of this creation for this touring production and not make them believe, I want them to believe. And, and so I never ask an actor in a leading role to do what another actor did in a leading role. 
I ask them to perform the role and I guide them to the performance that is very similar to the one on Broadway, but certainly influenced by what they're bringing to the stage. So their investment, when I walk away from the show, if they need to draw on their investment, they know where to go to get that, to do the performance, right? They're invested in the performance. And, and Jerry, I, think, I think that's really important. Jerry, I've heard you say to me confidentially as two friends talking uh, that somebody who was originated a role never really got where you wanted them to go. And you would say, but I've, I've got a great person going out on the first national tour and I'm, I'm going to fix that. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah I mean, that's, that's the fascinating thing is sometimes the best person didn't originate the role, right? Yeah. Sometimes no, I, I haven't had that experience too often, uh, but sometimes that can happen. Yeah. Um, okay. And any other questions? Um, we got Brooke. And okay, go ahead, Brooke. Um, Jerry, have you ever? Um, I know you're very busy. Uh, have you ever gone to see a regional production of one of your shows? Ah, uh, yeah, of course. How how's that gone? <laughs> Well, I went to, I, the most recent one was the Muni. Uh, last summer, I went to the Muni to see the Muni production of Kinky Boots. Is that which St. Was, Louis? St. Louis? And yeah, outdoors. It's, it's where I actually got my equity card, and it's now run by Mike Isaacson, who's a producer for me on another show that I'm working on. And it's, it was one of the original producers on Legally Blonde. Um, but um, I went to see it because my associate director and my associate choreographer put the show together. So they used my choreography, but of course they did their own version of the show, their own sets, their own costumes. It was close, but not exactly. And I also went to Webster University to see their college production of Legally Blonde, where, you know, cause I went to school there when they did Legally Blonde. Uh, so if I'm available and I'm invited to see other productions, I go all the time. I love watching people do things with, with something that I've worked on, Hairspray, Kinky Boots, Legally Blonde. And a lot of my associates have had the opportunity to choreograph productions that they were in for me. And so I love going and cheering them on, yeah. Uh, on, just, go, just go for ahead, the, oh, I'm sorry, Mark. Um, you no, know, I was gonna say, go ahead. I have a, um, you, you talk and then I have a question from, I think it's Chaney or Chani Greaves. Yeah. I'm getting that name wrong, but you ask your question first. Uh, I was just going to say it might be worth mentioning to our students that um, the stage director, stage direction and choreographers union protects your work. So if you yeah. put on a production, a regional production, even if you get the rights to the show, you're not allowed to just copy videos that you see of Jerry's work. And I just right. thought it was worth mentioning that. Well, it's also worth mentioning if there are any budding directors or choreographers out there, I started a company called The Original Production. And you can go to The Original Production. We're on Instagram, we're on, we're on um, whatever. Um, you can go to The Original Production through MTI, actually, a, a Music Theater International or TRW. And we license the original choreography to shows to your productions or your choreographer who wants to do the original choreography. So we've got Kinky Boots, Hairspray, Legally Blonde, we've got Sergio's Adams Family, uh, Freaky Friday, we've got the original Annie, Peter Gennaro's choreography taught by his daughter. We have the junior versions of all of those shows. Um, I, I lose track of what shows we have and we have a few in the can that are coming. But not only do you get these videos of us teaching you the work, on Legally Blonde, for instance, I interviewed Laura Bell, Andy, um, Carl, and Orfe, and talked about how they worked on developing their roles. So you get a little bit of an inside scoop on what an actor is doing in a musical, creating a role. And I, I don't say you have to copy everything of mine, but it's sort of like, I'm your collaborator. I want you to do a great production. So if you wanna pay the $400 or whatever it is, you've got access to, you know, every, when I was a kid, I wanted to do the original Broadway West Side Story. I wanted to do the original stuff. So I watched the movie a hundred times until I could do it. And then I did it. And then I learned I wasn't supposed to do it because I wasn't supposed to do it without a license. But, you know, 
It's all in evolution and evolution. Mostly I wanted to collaborate because a lot of kids were taking the choreography off of the M MTV Legally Blonde. And I was seeing a lot of videos and they were wrong and I wanted them to do it right. So I wanted to coach them and help them. And that's how the, that's how the whole thing came about. Um, we have a question from Chani or Chaney. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing it. Hi, Jerry. How beneficial do you think it is to have an extensive college education as an actor? You got it right the first try. Well, if I had not gone to Webster College and been in the conservatory program at Webster College, I am certain I would not have become the choreographer or director I became. When I walked on campus at Webster College, I had never taken a ballet class. I didn't take my first ballet class until I was 18 years old in college. I took tap, jazz, and a little bit of acro, but I had never taken a ballet class. I got to college and I was enrolled in ballet one. And I got into the ballet class and I was like, oh my God, this is hard and I love it. I want more. So I asked the teacher if I could audit ballet too. And he said, sure. And then I found out there was a dance company. And so I auditioned for the dance company. I got in the dance company. And then I was taking ballet at night with the dance company. And then I started auditing ballet three. In two years, I went from somebody who couldn't do a glissade to somebody who could do brise battues across the floor. And that's how I got Brigadoon. Because when I walked in for my first audition for Agnes DeMille, it was eight assemblies front, eight assembly back, brise about two, brise about two, brise about two, brise about two, stand. And she said, I'll take him. He's tall, he's got good ballet, and he can be a clan leader. I got my first Broadway show done. So, and I would yeah, say, I would go say other, to college. <laughs> yeah, the other good thing about a college education is because you know, you can all start out wanting to be a performer. I ended up becoming a writer slash producer. And at, uh, I went to Cal State Fullerton and they made me uh, take costume design and set design. And I never thought as a singer, I would ever have to use them. Once you become an executive producer, I have to know how costumes are used to help tell stories um, and sets, the same with sets and having attitude about it. So the great thing about a college um, education and especially if you get a theater major, none of it goes to waste. Um, it, you know, all of yeah, that stuff. I, I, I I think, the, I think the, 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 the easy answer to it is why wouldn't you go to college? If yeah. you can afford to go to college and you can afford to train in a place where it's concentrated, we're all in a cocoon. Each of us are in our own cocoon. And when it's time for us to bust out of the cocoon and our, our wings to spread, they will. I didn't finish college because my sophomore year, I went to New York to visit friends and I got that Broadway show. So then I went back to New York my junior year and I got credit to be in New York and be in two Broadway shows. And then I got a movie and I said, I'm not coming back to school. And they said, we understand. So I did three years. And then when I won a Tony Award, they gave me an honorary degree anyway. So it all worked out. So <laughs> go to school. Great. We have time for uh, one or two more questions. Do, do any of you kids, uh, uh, Olivia Delano. Oh, I wasn't raising my hand, but I will ask a question. Hi, my name is Olivia. Um, I am gonna be in my second year at YA. And um, I just wanna see like how like you made your break as a choreographer. Like uh, I know you got your Broadway shows and everything, but I don't know if it like just kind of fell into your hands. Like if it was a certain opportunity that just- No, it's a good question. It's a really good question, Olivia. Are you a choreographer? Do you wanna be a choreographer? No, I, I like to dance, but I'm not that good at it. I, originally started out with singing and acting. Oh, uh, well, I am, when I was, I guess when I was 23, I decided I wanted to stop dancing and be a choreographer. So I wanted to work with other choreographers. So I started assisting a lot of people in New York City. And I thought I was gonna be a choreographer next year. I thought, well, I'll, I'll get a job, I'll get a job as a choreographer within a year. It took me 17 years to get a Broadway show. I did not get my first Broadway show until I was 40 years old. So for 17 years, I worked as an associate and assistant to every choreographer I could work with. One of the best choreographers I ever got a chance to work with and one of the most magical moments was um, I was auditioning for 
um, Starlight Express for Arlene Phillips, the choreographer of that and Saturday Night Fever and a lot of great things. And she cast me in Starlight Express. I was going to be her dance captain in the Broadway production. But Trevor Nunn, the director, didn't see me. And I went away and I couldn't audition for the final callback. And so he wouldn't hire me. So I didn't get the show. So Arlene is in tech rehearsal for the show and she's working on a video, a music video. And she says, she calls me up and she says, Jerry, I need an associate choreographer tomorrow. It's gonna to be three days. It's a new music video for a new artist. And can you meet me and can you be my associate choreographer? I said, absolutely. I showed up in the room. I worked one day with her and four dancers. I went to the studio. She came with me. She left to go to tech rehearsal and in walked the artist. And I went, oh, hi. And I didn't know who she was. She was 23, I was 26. The song was, oh, I wanna dance with somebody. I wanna feel the heat with them. And I ended up choreographing that video for Whitney Houston. And I was 26 years old. Oh, there, and, Leaf Green has the photo. Leaf Green has the photo. And, and it was like, it was like, you know, just being in the right place at the right time. And, uh, you know, it, 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 when it's supposed to happen, it'll happen. You just got to keep going, keep, keep the faith. Yes, as they say, luck favors the prepared. That's um, right. We, we got one more time for one more question. So let's make it a good one. Uh, so, and I'm going to pronounce your name wrong. Cyan Cena? How off was I? No, you were right on. You got it right. Okay. <laughs> so as performers, I know we hear no more often than we hear yes, like in auditions. Yeah. Um, I just want to know, like, how you got through the nose. Like, like, how did you push through, like, rejection? Uh, I think being confident in myself helped a lot. And being, com being com I'm going to say not even confident, comfortable. Comfortable in who I was. And believing that I had something to offer whenever, when it, but, what, but what Mark just said, I always say, you know, it's opportunity is a knock at the door. The only thing you can do is prepare for that knock and prepare yourself to answer the door. If, if you're prepared when that knock comes and, and you go, you're gonna, you're gonna have a good day. But if you're not prepared, it, you won't have a good day. It won't turn out in your favor. But you know, I wanna tell, I wanna tell you one really amazing story that sticks with me all the time about auditioning. And about how, you know, especially when you're young and you're auditioning all the time and you're getting a lot of no's and then you finally get a yes. Um, do you know the actor John Lithgow? John Lithgow, uh, he's done so Third many, Rock so from many. The Sun, The Crown. Incredible, and incredible things. Um, so John Lithgow was, we wanted him to play the lead in Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, the musical on Broadway. And so Jack O'Brien and I called John up and said, John, we want you to play the lead. It's an offer. We're going to start a reading in two weeks, blah, 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 blah. And John said, oh, my God, because he'd wanted to do a musical. And we knew this and we knew him. And he said, yes, I want to do it. He said, but I'm not, I'm not taking the offer. I said, he said, I have to come in and audition for you. I won't do it unless you let me audition. He begged us to audition because he wanted to make sure that we were sure he was the right person for the part. So he came in, he danced, he sang, and he read three scenes for myself, Jack O'Brien, the book writer and the author, David Yazbek and, and um, um, uh, 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 I can't believe you you're know forgetting who. the guy who wrote the book. You know who, you know who. Oh, Jeffrey Lane, Jeffrey Lane, Jeffrey Lane. Jeffrey Lane, David Yazbek, myself and Jack O'Brien. He came in and auditioned for us. He's John Lithgow, he's like a star. But he said, I want to make sure it's the fit and you guys really want me. And I still, I always remember that because as actors, that's your job. Your job, is, your job isn't getting the part, your job is the audition. That's the job. I think, you know what, and I think that what that says about him is that he cares enough about the, the project. He wants to make sure that the creators are pleased with his yeah. work, you know, and, and I think that and, and, says and, you a lot know, about to, him. To be a great, to do a great audition, you only have to do one thing. You just have to go in and be you because there's only one you. 
and, and there's only one role. And the role, if you're the right person for the role, it's you that's right. It's not the next person, right? So all you got to do is be the best version of you that you can possibly be. And that's why I'm saying you have to be comfortable with who you are when you walk in there, because I smell it. I smell the comfort, <laughs> right? If you come in and you're so comfortable, I know it. I absolutely, I know it. If you're scared, if you're tense, if you've had a bad day, you're not feeling good, I know it. You know, I try to relax people when they come into the room because I want you to have the best possible audition because I need you. I can't do it without you. Remember that also. I need you in order to tell a story. Uh, and sometimes, so, and sometimes people come in and they want the job too much. And yeah, that messes up their audition. Yeah, because they really want it, and it's like, oh no, calm down, calm down. Yeah. Well, listen, um, I am just so pleased to be able to interview Jerry. He has really had a very, very important career, and e even those of us, you know, stuck in TV land in Hollywood, know about Jerry Mitchell and all the tremendous work he's done. <laughs> for the for the past couple of uh decades jesus jerry where did all the, where did the last 40 years go yeah it just went by way too quickly um i'm not that you, old <laughs> um thank you so much for coming in and listening um to this so i hope you had a good time and let's give a, a hand to jerry mitchell ladies and gentlemen thank you all hey gang stay safe stay healthy um, wear your masks, wash your hands, and, uh, and uh, hopefully, boy, when, when, the, when we're out of this, this they're going to need entertainment. They're going to need lifting up. They're going to need it more than they've ever needed it before. So get ready. Get ready for it. All right. Thank you, Jerry, for spending time with us. So good to see you. Thank you, kids. And we look forward to seeing you all in a few weeks. Bye, everybody. Care.